So this is my old dual turntable, which I haven't used for many years. So uh, I've just unpacked it after a long time. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit broken, uh, but I will have it repaired in the next days and uh, just put it to good use. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another video where I show you some of my records. Um, what a highly original concept. <laughs> and I'm um, sitting here with my blue crate uh, filled with all the records that I had been listening to in the last weeks. Um, even some new purchases amongst them. And I thought before I start uh, to put them back on the shelf, since I unfortunately have no assistants or servants or slaves to do that for me. Mm. Um why not make a video first and show some of them. Um, let's begin with a truly wonderful album, one of the most beautiful albums ever recorded. I'm serious. I'm talking about Nino and Radaya by Nino Ferrer. Now this is a brilliant record that uh, came out in 1974. Uh, this is a reissue um, that uh, was uh, uh, put out by Barclay, by the label Barclay in 2018 and is somewhat unique because uh, I think in this format it have not existed before which is a kind of a very contrived story. I even don't know if I should start to tell it because knowing me it will take forever uh, and it will end up in a giant ramble. But um, the point is uh, Nino Ferrer was a very famous uh, singer and uh, songwriter from the 60s and part of this whole uh, French Ye Ye movement. Uh, so um, he was known for kind of humorous and uh, very kind of light-hearted uh, songs. And uh, that was kind of what uh, the French and the record company and the public uh, expected of him. Uh, but he wasn't happy with that role because Privately, he was totally immersed into in this new world of uh, rock and beat music that came from the USA and that came from Great Britain and psychedelic rock and soul and funk. And he was totally into that. And that's what he wanted to do. So uh, there was a certain kind of a resistance from the audience, which was always a little bit heartbreaking for him because he kind of realized that he will have to march through those inhibitions to just achieve the type of music that he wanted to do. And this album here is certainly probably one of the pinnacles uh, of his creative life. Um, it is a wonderful funk slash soul slash psychedelic rock album um, that has, um, in my opinion, just one great song in it after the other. Uh, there is just for me there is just not a not one hollow moment on this album. It's a beautiful record that I truly enjoy. Um, my personal highlights probably uh, would be the track Hot Toddy uh, and certainly Looking for You. Uh, Looking for You has this kind of a Serge Gainsbourg vibe, I think. Um, but overall, this whole record is just a beautiful ride from beginning to the end. Now the the most prominent track on this album is called The South. And uh, interestingly, um, um, back in the day, Nino Ferrer had been con convinced to record the song in two versions. One version was kind of more French, radio friendly in French language and with an orchestra. And uh, while the other one is kind of more funky and more rock driven and it was meant uh, for this album, like for an international release. Um, so back in the day, you never you never got these two songs on the same or these two versions on the same album. Uh, if you wanted the French version, you probably had to look for a seven inch or something. Um, so that's what Barclay did. They just put the French version as the last one uh, on uh, on the album and uh, kind of created this perfect version. I have also a little seven inch inside of here. So this is uh, these are two tracks by. The singer Radaya, uh, who you can also see here on the cover. Uh, now she's not just modeling for Nino Ferrer here on on, on the record cover. I mean, she she was singing uh, background vocals, and was certainly quite involved in the production. 
And uh, Nino Ferrer also produced two tracks, uh, wrote and produced for her, called Playboy Scout and Crocodiciel, which uh, were released probably uh, so two years later, one and a half years later, after after Nina, Nino and Redaya. I love uh, putting seven inches inside album sleeves. Like a little surprise! <laughs> so, um... The reason why this album, there is a particular reason why this record is funky as hell. And the reason uh, comes from New York. Because in New York, back in the day, there was a band called Lafayette Afro Rock Band. And these guys were playing kind of a first generation uh, funk. So very, very kind of heavy rock, psychedelic rock. Uh, with a lot of brass sections and very kind of merciless and driving uh, funk sound of the late 60s, early 70s. But um, I think at a certain point they felt like they have uh, achieved everything they could in New York. And they moved to France, surprisingly, because they felt like things were happening there. So they changed their name into ICE, I-C-E. And um, yeah, they played on a whole bunch of records and uh, kind of helped all these musicians in France that wanted to change their sound. They kind of helped them to become more funky and uh, more energetic. And uh, that's exactly what happened on this record. So um, this is a really a great pleasure if you like funk music. But at the same time, it has certainly this kind of a French um, kind of post-chanson type of uh, vibe to it as well and uh, it's a little naughty as you would expect from a, from a French artist and um, so a lovely album from the beginning to the end um, I certainly did not plan to talk about one single record for such a long time uh, so don't worry I will not be so uh, detailed about the other albums but um, this record certainly deserves it this is uh, really one of uh, the great albums from France I personally I believe um, yeah, so uh, Nino and Radaya by Nino Ferrer. Let me put it here. Ah, so what next? Yeah, no, kind of a similar vibe. Um, it's this next album, actually, and this is quite a wonderful one. So this is What Color Is Love by Terry Callier. And um, this is a wonderful jazzy soul album by an outstanding singer. And... Uh, Again, this is a record that's quite beautiful, just from beginning to the end. Um, Terry Kelly has, has a wonderful voice that is very, very jazzy, but uh, he can also perfectly kind of switch it up and immediately become this very strong kind of R&B soul singer. And uh, the same goes for the music. Often the songs begin very kind of calm and very, very unsuspicious and uh, almost like a very soft folk rock album but uh, then these tracks often escalate into these wonderful huge large canvas arrangements uh, very cinematic and this is a wonderful wonderful album um, if you if you love to see yourself standing in the night on the balcony of your house and uh, holding a whiskey glass in your hand looking at uh, a night city this is a perfect soundtrack for that believe me <laughs> so terry Callier, what color is love and by the way that this is a reissue on music on vinyl yeah now i adapt into these two artists um, from America. Um, this is an album called A Beginner's Mind uh, by two singers called uh, Sufjan Stevens and Angelo Di Augustine. This is um, a super interesting and somewhat subversive folk album. Uh, subversive means that uh, as far as the music goes it's all not very conspicuous it's a uh, very charming very harmonic music with a touch of sadness and melancholy of course but uh, if you look closer it's a uh, it's an album it's like a concept album mostly influenced by um kind of hollywood cult movies and this whole kind of a tinseltown americana atmosphere and uh, that's what i mean by subversive because while certain songs start very 
very charming and kind of very calm. You quickly find yourself, uh, as far as the lyrics, for example, go. You quickly find yourself uh, kind of in a world of uh, of violence and murder. And um, just let me show you a the inner sleeve, which is kind of nice. Um, so I think this speaks for itself. <laughs> so this is an interesting one. Uh, now the album has some great kind of suggestive uh, track or song titles like Olympus or uh, The Pillar of Souls or Lady Macbeth in Chains or Cimmerian Shade uh, and so on. So um, it's all very evocative uh, and certainly a kind of interesting original project. So what else do I have here? Oh yeah, a while ago I got me Jumping Jive by Joe Jackson. I mean, I have a constantly growing Joe Jackson collection, uh, particularly almost everything he did in the 70s and 80s. And uh, one or two are still missing. I think I'm still missing the Tucker soundtrack. Um, and uh, I was missing this one. So I just grabbed it when I saw the chance. Um, it's uh, certainly the one album where um, Joe Jackson went kind of full swing certainly removed himself completely from this entire kind of a post-punk rock uh, slash jazz funk uh, environment. Also the cover design was uh, photographed and designed by Anton Corbijn and uh, one of the rare opportunities to see Graham maybe with a full beard <laughs> which I have not seen before. So um, yeah Joe Jackson, Jumping Jive. Um, what else do we have here? Oh yes, this is, a, <laughs> this is an interesting album here. So um, this is uh, the, 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 the debut album by Sheena and the Rockets. Now this is a Japanese punk rock band, but uh, of course what makes uh, this album so fascinating for posterity is the fact that this is the only, kind of the only time in history that uh, the famous band Yellow Magic Orchestra went full punk rock. Uh, this is not particularly the style they are known for, but it's the entire band here, including uh, Hideki Matsutake. Um, I, the, the story was probably that this had been picked up or produced by Harumi Hosono. Now, they had been like a local band from the city of Fukuoka, and um, but at the same time, the 70s were kind of ending at this point in time and Hosono felt that he had to prep the band up for the 80s so kind of update their sound um, which meant uh, he brought his Yellow Magic Orchestra buddies and uh, they started to add all the synthesizers to this punk rock sound and created this kind of strange uh, slightly aggressive uh, new wave sound but of course of course if you listen to it now it sounds all super charming and it's kind of a it's the type of album that you expect appearing as part of a Quentin Tarantino movie soundtrack or something. So uh, it's a, it's an interesting mix of a Japanese punk rock four-piece uh, collaborating with uh, four synthesizer guys. <laughs> so it's an interesting mixture. Here, look at the inner sleeve. Uh, so um, not the type of music I would be listening every day far from it but at the same time I certainly enjoy owning this type of records and uh, just kind of uh, enlarges my general uh, Hosono Sakamoto Takahashi collection um, next album Tagomago by Ken it's a brilliant record uh, that uh, sounds quite uh, unique. I think uh, from all the big famous the German uh, kind of psychedelic rock bands of the 70s, Can took me probably the longest to like, uh, simply because it. I always I have I always had a bit of a hard time to kind of uh, get through the vocals, and uh, their sound is somewhat odd. Um, but um, I really like this album. This is so fascinating and particularly the second half of it. Uh, this is a double album and um, the side three and four I think they are quite outstanding. 
But um, I really enjoy just listening to this album from beginning to the end. Uh, now this is a brand new re-release. Um, the Gatefold Sleeve. So this is a wonderful record. Um, Yaki Liebezeit on drums, fantastic. Uh, Holger Chukai on bass. So um, this is a uh, very kind of funky and yet very psychedelic and very experimental and quite crazy at times. Uh, so uh, it's one of those bands that um, you can't actually categorize them. They are just a thing of their own. Now this is brand new and this is amazing. This is, I mean, the year is halfway in for sure, but um, this is my strong contender for the, my favorite record of 2022. Um, this is the debut album by the Turkish band Lalalar and it's called Bicinete Bakar and uh, <clears throat> it's a double album. I don't know if it's double album by the strength of length. Uh, it's more like uh, it's very luxuriously printed on two two discs, um, but has kind of the general length of a single album. Now I've already shown this band quite a while ago because, uh, like two maybe three years ago, they had put out two seven inches uh, by the Bongo Joe label in Switzerland, um, who also uh, released this album. Now this band is amazing. Now, in parts, these guys are kind of from the um, from the gang around uh, the Istanbul-based singer Gaye Suakyol, and um, this is a great sound. I became immediately addicted to it. You imagine this being kind of a mixture of very dark new wave music, uh, kind of a callback to kind of the early '80s EBM and new wave sound and uh, even uh, stuff like early Nine Inch Nails, but at the same time beautifully interwoven with uh, Anadolu rock, so it's kind of a Turkish psychedelic rock. And um, this goes very well together. They had this wonderful baritone um, singer and uh, great sound. It's an outstanding record and uh, great fun to listen. And um, yeah, so um, if you are looking for something entirely new and quite fascinating, uh, check out this record. The band is called La La Lar. And this just came out not that long ago, a few weeks. So um, then, uh, let me put it out of the sleeve. I will probably cut those boring moments out. So um, I've been listening quite a lot to Herbie Hancock these days and this is a nice uh, re-release that came out of his album Sextant. So this album came out in 1973 and stylistically it certainly flies deep inside the Miles Davis territory. There's no doubt about that. It's just the nature of the songs. I mean you have an album with three tracks on it and uh, uh, so you have these long, kind of brooding, exploratory jams going on there. And um, uh, at, at the same time, Herbie Hancock is adding all these kind of futuristic science fiction type of uh, synthesizer sounds to the mix. And it's super fascinating. I really like this album. At the same time, it kind of marks the end of uh, this whole Muandishi era of Herbie Hancock's music. Uh, and from now on. Slowly but sure, um, the music will drift strongly towards uh, jazz funk. Um, so this is kind of the last uh, sort of a heavy fusion album. Um, I think the next one uh, was Headhunters then, right? You got Benny Maupin on, on saxophone and flute. Uh, there's a lot of kind of great flute playing here, actually. Uh, you got Julian Priester and uh, Eddie Henderson on brass, uh, Buster Williams on bass and uh, Billy Hart on drums. So this is a great lineup and uh, a very idiosyncratic uh, fusion music uh, that uh, in parts feels more like a soundtrack to a really kind of psychedelic science fiction movie probably. Also a wonderful iconic cover design by uh, Robert Sprinkett. Uh, who did uh, a few more of Herbie Hancock's uh, records. Um, so it's one of the great album covers, isn't it? So yeah, lovely album. 
again this was a reprint on the music on vinyl and um, one of my latest um, purchases now uh, staying with Herbie Hancock um, this album came came like came out like two years later this is Thrust uh, so this is already much heavier into the jazz funk territory um, I really love this album. This is one of my favorite albums actually by Herbie Hancock. Um, still very spacey and uh, very experimental, but at the same time a lot of uh, kind of Afro-funk um, aesthetic to it and um, great stuff. Wonderful record uh, and uh, certainly not, not, not a bad album to start exploring Herbie Hancock if uh, you um, never listened to him before, which uh, may be possible. Tough to imagine. I mean, when I started to listen to music at all, just on my own, being 12 years old, um, Rocket just came out. So, strangely enough, uh, Herbie Hancock was already there, uh, looking over my cradle at the beginning, at the very beginning. Um, so, um, let's continue. Um, yeah, this here is uh, the debut album by the Danish band Secret Oyster. Uh, this is a very nice reissue that I had uh, just bought. Um, um, I'm, I'm slowly reaching uh, my full Secret Oyster potential by having all of their records. Uh, I think I'm missing still one. Um, so this came out in 1973 I think um, and again this is a wonderful mixture of progressive rock and jazz fusion. Um, I think by a band that was very closely tied um, with uh, this whole uh, Christiania movement in Copenhagen. Um, and um, yeah, wonderful band with a lot of theatrics. Um, I think they, they recorded a lot of music as a companion to theater pieces and all kind of, uh, kind of stage performances. So uh, it's usually mostly instrumental and uh, with a lot of uh, great sax playing and uh, yeah wonderful record I really like their first album I mean they already came out of the stable really with a big blast and this is a really great record and um, it's by the way a reissue that came out by long hair uh, so um, lately I had bought some records that all came out on long hair I think they are kind of releasing some really good stuff these days and I have one more record left uh, I think yeah at least for this video we have to cut it then so this is a this is an album that I have not heard for over 30 years but I, I heard it quite a lot in the 80s um, and um, I was quite surprised how fresh it still felt to my ears but then again if you listen to stuff while being a teenager I think it gets kind of embossed into your into your uh, frontal cortical lobe uh, in a much better way than when I'm listening to music now. When I'm listening to music now, it's uh, I mean it's all kind of half dementia, right? But uh, if you listen to stuff like a teenager as a teenager, you, m you remember the music much better. Um, so uh, this is a somewhat underrated album, I think. It's called Truce by Jack Bruce and Robin Trower and uh, they did this in 1981. It's an incredible tight three-piece uh, with uh, Reg Isidore on drums and Jack Bruce on uh, bass and vocals and Robin Trower uh, of course of Procol Harum's fame on uh, guitar. So this is a kind of a purist purist trio recording. Uh, there are almost no real overdubs happening here and uh, so um, if uh, if Trower is playing a guitar solo, then uh, the rest of the music is just drums and bass. So uh, there are no kind of additional um, guitar tracks snuck into the mix. But that being said, this record is funky as hell. I think this is mostly Reg Isidore's uh, doing, but uh, also uh, Jack Bruce is really funky here. Um, really funky bass playing here. And uh, quite quite impressive actually. So um, um, so that's why I think that this record is generally a little bit underappreciated and probably would deserve to be better known. Um, the songs here are all quite quite nice. There's just not I, there's not a single song here that I would 
consider kind of a stinker or something. Um, so this album goes really down well. You just listen to it and it's just one cool song after the other. And um, Jack Bruce's voice is quite great here. So um, I'm really happy with this record. I've um, been giving it like at least five listens in the last two or three weeks and um, good stuff. So um, this was all for now. I have much more records, but... Um, that is a story for another day. All right, so uh, have a nice day. Um, don't believe everything the press says <laughs> and keep spinning your records. See you next time. Bye bye.